Parshas Ekev has 111 verses and seven mitzvos, and it's a continuation of Moshe's speech to the nation before his passing. And as in the previous few weeks, it is jam-packed with insights and with timeless lessons, and it seamlessly pivots between the subjects, and of course, all the commentaries are trying to piece together the flow and the internal consistencies between the various sections. And like in previous weeks, we've had Moshe looking back and admonishing and rebuking the people for their misdeeds of yore, of yesteryear. And in addition, it's also going to look, be looking forward, Moshe giving them guidance for their pending conquest of the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. And as a general rule, as we progress through Devarim, through Deuteronomy, it's less backward-looking rebuke and more forward-looking guidance. And it begins with a wonderful promise. This shall be the reward for you when you hearken to these ordinances, you observe and perform them. Hashem your God will safeguard for you the covenant and the kindness that he swore to your forefathers. He will love you, bless you, multiply you. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your land, your grain, your wine, your oil, your offspring, your cattle, your flock, your sheep, your goats. You'll be entirely blessed. There won't be any infertility. All the illnesses, all the maladies will be removed from you, will be placed upon your enemies, you'll destroy the people that are looking to do you harm, and you will conquer the land easily. So this is an amazing promise. If you guard, if you obey, if you adhere to the mitzvos, then the Almighty will keep His promises to you, He'll love you, He'll bless you, give you prosperity, security, fertility, health, all the good things, you'll vanquish your enemies. And this is, of course, an amazing divine promise. However, it's predicated upon you observing the mitzvos. Now, Rashi asks the question, which mitzvos, which mitzvos garner this wonderful blessing? And he tells us something maybe a bit surprising. He says that this is not the big, difficult, challenging mitzvos. Rather, to the contrary, these are the easy mitzvos that people trample over with their heels. The verse um, and the Parsha, in fact, has the word ekev. Ekev means on the heels of. And it's hinting to the fact that if you do the mitzvahs that people tend to not regard as so important, tend to disregard, tend to trample over them, they're not so important. If you do those mitzvahs, then you're going to generate, you're going to kickstart all this uh, amazing blessings that the Torah promises us. And the obvious question is, you know, why would these amazing promises be contingent on the people obeying the more minor mitzvos, the mitzvos that people tend to neglect. Aren't those mitzvos minor for a reason? Doesn't it make more sense for Moshe and the Torah to tell us that when we do the major mitzvos, the big mitzvos, the mitzvos that are so hard, so unconquerable ostensibly, if we do those mitzvos, then we'll have the tremendous blessing. Why is it the easy mitzvos that create this promise of all these amazing things to us and to our nation? So maybe we could suggest a few answers. You know, first of all, the idea of a hierarchy to mitzvahs, the idea that some mitzvahs are more important and some mitzvahs are less important, the ones that we tend to trample upon with our heels. Where does that hierarchy come from? That's from us. That's not from God. God doesn't assign mitzvahs a a hierarchy. We are the ones that view certain mitzvahs as more important and others as less important, maybe ones that we don't value as much, we tend to trample upon it. But the Torah, it doesn't assign a hierarchy. In fact, we're encouraged to not make a ranking, a totem pole of mitzvahs, what's more important, what's less important. We're encouraged to do all, even the easy mitzvahs as well and as committedly as we do the more difficult mitzvahs. So the whole concept of mitzvahs being more important, less important, is a human creation. It's not from God. And as a result, it turns out that when we observe the minor mitzvos, the things that we tend to not view them as so important, the reason why we're doing it is because the Almighty told us to do it. If not for the Almighty telling us to do it, we would say this is not so important. This is something which is a little bit more minor. This is something you could trample upon with your heels. But the major mitzvos, maybe those are the things that we would do even if we weren't commanded to do so. You know, even societies that don't have Torah believe in major mitzvos that, that of course, are part of the Torah as well. Hence, it's, it's precisely the minor mitzvos that foster a bond 
between man and God because the only reason why someone would do the quote-unquote minor mitzvah, the mitzvah that the human tends to disregard, is precisely because the Almighty instructed that. And therefore, God will respond reciprocally by showing man love in return when man does the minor mitzvah. And as a general rule, we are trained to strive to perform mitzvos not because of the fact that we would do it anyhow, but specifically because God instructed us to do that. And by doing the mitzvah with that intention, with that motivation, that actually creates a bond between us and the Almighty. My grandfather, blessed memory, he offered a second approach to understand why the minor mitzvos, why they engender this tremendous promise of blessing and prosperity and health and security. And he said that when someone does a major mitzvah, something that was very difficult, they had to overcome, they had to develop the wherewithal and the tenacity and the internal fortitude to do the mitzvah. It was a difficult mitzvah. It was so hard. But after they're done, they feel fantastic about themselves. And they look at everyone else with disdain and they become haughty. And there is, so to speak, an, a backlash. You trying to do something good and you do something good but now you feel like you're holier than thou, you're better than other people, now you lost your humility. And thus, what happens is you're going to exchange the good character for the mitzvah and maybe you'll even lose more than you gain. But when someone does a minor mitzvah, there is a smaller chance, a lesser chance that will have that backlash and that will cause haughtiness and therefore the net result of the more minor mitzvah is greater than even a more difficult mitzvah that is reduced, its power is reduced by the haughtiness that it brings along with it. So those are some ideas here on, on this introduction and this promise. Now the Balaturim points out that the word Akev, which means again on the heels of, it is related to the word Keva, it's the same letters as the word Kev, which means consistency. And he suggests an idea that when someone makes their Torah and their study and their observance of mitzvahs consistent, that's what breeds real change, and if someone is not flaky, if someone is consistent, they'll actually change, and therefore they'll become meritorious and deserving of God's divine reward. Alternatively, he suggests that the word of the word heal, represents humility. It's the last part of the body to move, and consequently, when someone's humble, then they become deserving of God's goodness. And then we see, okay, so, so we do the mitzvos, and what's going to be? So we're told in verse 16, you'll devour all the people that Hashem, your God, will deliver to you. Your eye shall not pity them. You shall not worship their gods, for it is a snare for you. Of course, this is the central theme of the book of Deuteronomy. Moshe is warning the people to not fall into the trap of idolatry. You're about to go into a very bad neighborhood. The Canaanite nations are all idolaters, and therefore, make sure you devour them, you destroy them. Don't show pity to them. Destroy them, destroy the idolaters, and destroy their gods. It is a snare. It's a trap. And don't get caught in the trap. Now, it's a little bit uh, difficult for us to, to to stomach the idea of not showing pity. And the Ramban here has a powerful line. He tells us that with mercy, with pityness, a judge destroys judgment. You know, we have a tendency to show mercy. In fact, the Talmud teaches that the hallmark of our nation is that we're a nation of merciful people. We're not cruel. But with respect to judgment, you have to sometimes put aside the mercy, put aside the pity, because otherwise it could destroy the concept of judgment. And then Moshe continues, perhaps you will say in your heart, these nations are more numerous than I. How will I be able to drive them out? And Moshe assures them, do not fear them. Remember what God did to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians. And just as God destroyed Pharaoh and the Egyptians, so too he will vanquish your current enemies. He's going to send a swarm of hornets to blind them, to attack them in their hiding places. And in, actually, in the end, in the book of Joshua, it talks about these, these hornets. In fact, there were two swarms of hornets, one that was spinning poison uh, from across the uh, the Jordan, and that was in times of Moses, and one came with the conquest of Canaan that was done by Joshua. Their kings will be delivered to you. No one will stop you. Your conquest will be unimpeded by your enemies. 
But then we find out in verse 22 something very interesting and a little bit maybe counterintuitive. Hashem your God will thrust these nations from before you little by little. You will not be able to annihilate them quickly, lest the beast of the field increase against you. This is something, again, counterintuitive. We would not have imagined this if we were going to lay out the plan. The conquest will not be instantaneous. It will be slow and it will be gradual because if the victory comes too quickly, it's going to have negative consequences and has to be done bit by bit. And here we see another idea that God has a greater perspective, obviously, of the unanticipated consequences of how to go about doing something. If you would ask us, we want the conquest of Canaan to be instant and get rid of all the enemies and overnight transform the land and acquire it and conquer it. And here we see, no, there's a danger because the beasts of the field will increase against you. We have to slowly and gradually conquer Canaan. That is actually the best way to do it. This is something that maybe is a little hard for us to acknowledge always, that God understands not only what's best for us, but also how to get that good thing. And in fact, we're encouraged when we pray to actually yield to God and say, God, you know what's best for me. I want you to effectuate what's best for me in the best way possible because maybe I think I know what I want, but sometimes what I want or how I want to get what I want can actually be destructive. Hashem, God, will deliver them before you. He will confound them with great confusion. Their kings are going to be given to you, but you have to destroy their idols. The carved images of their gods you shall burn. You shall not covet and take for yourself the gold and the silver that is on them. Of course, the Canaanites would embellish their idols with gold and silver. Don't covet that because if you do, you'll be ensnared by it. It's an abomination. You have to destroy it. You cannot bring this abomination to your home. If you bring the idol into your home, it could be very destructive for you. Loathe it, destroy it, abominate it, for it is banned. We are encouraged to burn not only the idols, but also their associated paraphernalia, we are told here by the commentaries. And then chapter 8 starts to look a little bit back on, on the story of the Jewish nation over the course of the preceding 40 years. The entire commandment that I command you today, you shall, you shall observe to perform so that you may live and increase and come to possess the land that Hashem swore to your forefathers. Again, the conquest of Canaan is going to be miraculous and it's going to be contingent and reliant upon the degree that the Jewish nation obeys and does not relent from the commandments of God, if you observe the commandments, you will flourish. Otherwise, you will not. You shall remember the entire road on which Hashem, your God, led you these 40 years in the wilderness so as to afflict you, to test you, to know what is in your heart, whether you would observe his commandments or not. So now it's going to begin talking about what happened over the course of the previous 40 years in the wilderness where a nation, a nation comprised of millions, is being led by God in a miraculous way, surrounded by these clouds and the pillar of fire at night, eating the manna and even having their clothes grow with them and not becoming tarnished and their shoes and their feet not getting injured. An amazing description of the state of the nation and how they lived over the preceding 40 years. And the Ramban, he explains the connection. You know, begins The chapter begins by Moshe telling the people, obey the Torah. Obey the mitzvos, and God will do good to you. And then it continues by showing that the Almighty actually has proven in the past that he will sustain you, he will nourish you, he will take care of you in a miraculous fashion, and therefore you can rely upon him that just like he took care of you in the wilderness, he will continue to take care of you, provided that you do your share, you do your responsibility in upholding the Torah and obeying the mitzvos. And it talks specifically about the manna. And it's interesting how it's presented over here. The manna is presented as a test to afflict us. He afflicted you and let you hunger. Then he fed you the manna that you did not know, nor your forefathers knew, in order to make you know that not by bread alone does man live, rather by everything that emanates from the mouth of God does man live. The manna was food, but it was also a test. Your garment did not wear out upon you. Your feet did not swell. 
these 40 years. And you should know in your heart that just as a father will chastise his son, so too Hashem, your God, chastises you. So we see an interesting idea here that the manna was a great test for the nation, but also, of course, a great miracle where the Almighty sustained the nation by parachuting billions of meals over the course of 40 years, the nation of millions. And the idea here is that God could have, of course, navigated them via civilization. But instead, he chose to bring them through the wilderness. They had no solution other than to rely on God's benevolence that he would give them the manna every day. And the Rabban adds that the reason for this is that they'll know forever that he'll take care of us if we obey his word. And he indeed delivered. The clothing grew with them. Their feet did not swell. Rashi here tells us that the miraculous clouds of glory that enveloped the nation, they would be like, it would be like a, a, a washing machine and a dryer and a dry cleaning. It would clean their clothing and it would actually grow with them. A small child would have a pair of clothing and miraculously that clothing would grow as the child grew. Now there's another line here in verse three where Torah, the word of God, is compared to bread. And this is one of the big ideas uh, of Jewish philosophy, the idea of our soul, the idea that a human is more than just a body. It's a body that is fused with a heavenly soul. And we spoke about this in the past, but the idea that from the perspective of your body, you're like an animal. From the perspective of your soul, you're like an angel. And those two are fused together, and that creates the conflict of life that is humanity. And of course, Torah is there to help us veer towards our soul to become more angelic and less animalistic, because if we ignore Torah, the opposite will happen. And here we see that Torah is like bread. What that means is that just as the body is a living, breathing organism that needs sustenance or else it will cease to exist, the soul is the exact same thing in the spiritual realm. It too is a living, breathing organism and it too needs sustenance. The difference is that the sustenance of the soul is spiritual, i.e. Torah. Torah is like the bread for the soul. Just as bread feeds the body, Torah feeds the soul. And the only problem is, is that we don't connect to our soul on a sensory level. So if you go sometime without eating, your stomach starts to grumble. You could go a lifetime without Torah and you won't notice a thing because your senses are divorced from your soul, at least initially, and your senses are only connected to your body, and therefore we need some sort of external compulsion, i.e. Torah, to remind us not to forget to feed our soul. The Talmud actually equates someone teaching someone else Torah to feeding them bread. Just as you feed someone bread, you provide them sustenance. If you teach someone Torah, you are providing them spiritual sustenance. You are feeding their soul. And the verse here compares the challenges of the man on the challenges of the preceding 40 years to the challenges that a parent gives a child. You should know in your heart, verse 5, that just as a father will chastise his son, so Hashem your God chastises you. And the Rabban here, he adds that a, uh, a smart, a clever parent will not just give the child whatever the child wants, the child will be prevented from having what they want, maybe given it at some later date, so the child will appreciate it when he actually gets it. So too, the Almighty, like a loving and clever parent, will withhold the goodness from us so that we'll actually appreciate when when we get it. We're not going to be spoiled by God. And then verse 6, we read, You shall observe the commandments of Hashem your God to go in His ways and to fear Him. In fact, eight times in the Torah, including by my count three in our parsha, we are instructed to walk in the ways of God, to emulate him, and also to fear him. That is also numerous times in the Torah and many times in our parsha. And the reason why it highlights these things, because these are central, these are end goals of Torah to transform us. A human, like we said, can be an animal, can be an angel, can be an animal that is entirely instinctual and lives solely as a body, or it could be like an angel who walks in the ways of God, who fears God, who has a genuine 
and serious relationship with God and emulates God in his or her behavior. For Hashem, your God is bringing you to the good land, a land with streams of water, a land lacking nothing, a land of wheat, barley, grape, fig, and pomegranate, a land of olives and honey, which are, these are the seven species that Israel, the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, is praised with, a land you'll eat bread without poverty, you'll lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and whose mountains you can mine for copper. This is lauding the land of Israel. It's a fantastic land, a land of prosperity, and something we should thank God for. Now, it's interesting. The stones of the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, are metal. And we're told, I guess on a simple level, that the land of Israel is going to have valuable natural resources for us to enjoy. Now, the Talmud takes this a step further and derives homiletically that a Torah scholar must be as resolute as iron, as metal. There's a good kind of stubbornness when someone is unflinching and immovable from good things. The Talmud tells us, it deduces a verse in Jeremiah chapter 23. The verse says, which means like a hammer, he will shatter a stone. And that teaches us that a Torah scholar has to be as strong as metal, as strong as iron. And the deep insight behind that is that with Torah, we're trying to shatter the stone, which is the stone heart of the Yetzirah. We begin life with a propensity towards evil because of our Yetzirah, because of our evil inclination, which is like a stone heart. And we're supposed to get rid of that, we're supposed to shatter that via Torah. And the Talmud continues by telling us that uh, alternative verse for the idea that Torah style has to be like a metal implement is derived from our verse, chapter 8 of Deuteronomy, verse 9, a land whose stones are metal and it derives not stones but builders. Interesting idea that we are encouraged to become a little bit of the good kind of stubbornness. And then when it talks about the land of Israel – we're told that we have to bless God as a result. You will eat and you will be satisfied and bless Hashem your God for the good land that he gave you. In fact, there is only one verse in the Torah, one mitzvah in the Torah with respect to blessings. So the majority of the blessings are actually of rabbinic origin. And this is a central, of course, part of, of Jewish life, the idea of blessings. And blessings really surround our day, the prayers are composed of blessings. You go to the bathroom, you make a blessing. Uh, you eat something, you make a blessing beforehand, a blessing afterwards. There's six food categories, and each one of those food categories has a different blessing from before the meal. And then there's three post-meal or post-eating blessings, depending upon what you ate, provided that you ate a sufficient quantity, you make a blessing after the consumption of the food. And later on in the Parsha, in fact, we learn that you're supposed to make a 100 daily blessings. And the idea of blessings are really so central to Jewish life, but it's a really unusual idea, the idea that we are blessing God. It seems a little bit theologically problematic. So the commentaries here tell us that blessings really are not for us to bless God. God doesn't need our blessing, but they're for us. And when someone makes a blessing, it's a way of them not living mindlessly, not living without contemplation. When someone lives life without contemplation, without noticing, without awareness of what they're doing, without appreciating all the good things that they're able to enjoy, that's a life of entitlement. That's a life of selfishness. That's a life where someone does not have a relationship with other people and, of course, not a relationship with God. And when we bless, every time you make a blessing, it's an opportunity for you to notice and to stop taking life for granted, to notice the food that you're eating, to thank God, to notice the amazing miracle of digestion, the amazing miracle of the filtration that our body does to take out all the harm and all the poison, so to speak, in our food and to remove the waste. It's an amazing thing. And it's an opportunity for us to contemplate and to ruminate upon the delight of digestion and to, again, connect to God. My grandfather, the blessed memory, used to say that if someone is interested in advancing spiritually – the very first step on the spiritual ladder is to begin to notice the goodness that we have in our life, 
to stop living life as if everything is taken for granted, and that is done via blessings. And it makes sense. You'll have 100 blessings a day, and hopefully you'll actually take the lesson home. You'll actually absorb the message of the blessing and begin to live your life accordingly. There is a wonderful essay here by Rabbeinu B'chai about blessings, and he tells us that this verse serves as a portal to understand the concept of blessings in general. And he says, I'm going to give you two explanations. One of them is a simple explanation and one is a Kabbalistic explanation. If you want to see the Kabbalistic explanation, you can look inside. But the simple explanation, so he begins by telling us that blessings are not for God, but for us. And then he explains, because if someone makes a blessing on what they enjoy, they're testifying to God's oversight, that God created the food and the sustenance for us so that we should enjoy. And then he has a powerful line. And in the merit of the blessing, the grain and the fruits will be blessed and will be increased. And this is a powerful idea, that God's prosperity that he gives to us is elastic. It is malleable. We could change it. If we bless if we acknowledge God's goodness, then he will He will change the amount of goodness that he gives and give us more goodness. Whereas if we withhold from acknowledging God's goodness, he will curtail the amount of goodness that he gives, give us less of it. And then he adds another deep point. And this is all, by the way, in the simple explanation, not the Kabbalistic explanation. He adds that if someone takes, if someone enjoys, if someone eats without blessing, then they're stealing from God, which is the Talmud, and they're stealing from humanity. They're stealing from the Jewish people. Why? Because when we acknowledge God, we thank God for what he does, then we're deepening the connection that humanity has with God, and we're ensuring that God himself will oversee what happens to our nation. Whereas if we ignore the blessing then we're encouraging God to disregard our nation and to, so to speak, hand off the oversight of our people to other cosmic forces. This is an idea that we've seen in the past, that God, of course, is the source of all goodness, but it can be delivered to us via a filter, which is like an angel or some sort of cosmic being, some sort of galaxy in the words of of the... uh, of the ancient Jewish literature, the idea that God directly is not giving it to us, but he's giving it to us via some sort of intermediary. And of course, we want to have a relationship with God directly. That is the calling card of our nation. It's the clarion call of our people. And therefore, by doing blessings, we're encouraging that God himself is the deliverer of goodness to us, to our people, to our nation. And if we disregard the blessings, then we are encouraging him, so to speak, to outsource the giving or the transmission of the goodness to other forces. And then we read a warning against the lure of prosperity. Take care, lest you forget Hashem your God. By not observing his commandments, his ordinances, and his decrees, you'll eat, you'll become satisfied, you build houses, you'll settle, you'll flourish. You'll have lots of cattle, lots of sheep, lots of goats, you'll have lots of gold, lots of silver. Everything you have will increase. And then what's going to be? Your heart will become haughty. You're going to forget Hashem, your God, who took out of the land of Egypt. And here we see the idea that we've seen in the past, and in fact, we'll see again, that you'll live a life of abundance and you'll forget God. You'll think that it is your own strength of your hand that gave you everything. You may say in your heart, my strength and the might of my hand made me all this wealth. Then you shall remember Hashem, your God, that it is he who gives you the strength to make wealth in order to establish his covenant that he swore to your forefathers as this day. With success comes the risk of misattributing the source of the success. And therefore, we're encouraged to not make that mistake, to not fall into that trap. When things are good, to not forget that ultimately that is all from God. And the Ramban here, he points out that there's really two reasons why a person should not have the attitude of my strength and the might of my hand made me this wealth. Because, of course, even if your strength and the might of your hand did make you that wealth, where did you get the strength and the might of that hand? After all, you're not a creator. You're a creature who was created by God. And therefore, 
even if you did contribute towards it, ultimately that should not bring you haughtiness, that should not bring you arrogance, that should not lead to hubris, that should remind you to thank God even more because God gave you the hand, God gave you that mightiness to be able to do what you did. Moreover, says the Ramban, that even if someone does have great powers, after all, because that was given to him by God, it can be taken away from him by God as well. And therefore, something you don't have permanently, something that is quite fickle, something you could lose quite easily, it's not something that you should be prideful over. You should be happy about it. You should be thankful for it. You should have pleasure as a result of it, but don't be prideful as a result. What happens? God forbid, if we do forget Hashem, your God, it shall be that if you forget Hashem, your God, and go after the gods of others and worship them and prostrate yourself to them, I testify against you today that you will surely perish like the nation that Hashem caused to perish before you. Everything that God is planning to do to the Canaanite nation, the loss, the devastation that is accorded for the Canaanites will happen to you if you forget Hashem, your God. Chapter 9 begins with the reiteration of the principle that their upcoming victory was not a result of their greatness, but for other reasons. You're going to come to the land, you'll have nations that are greater and mightier than you, cities that are heavily fortified, children of giants, these tremendous Goliaths of enemies, you're going to destroy them. But don't take the message that it was because of you, because of my righteousness, because of the wickedness of the people. No, that's not the reason why. It's not because of your righteousness. It's not because of the uprightness of your heart, but rather because of the wickedness of those nations and because of the promise that God made to our forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Again, you should know that not because of your righteousness, Hashem, your God, give you this good land to possess it, for you are a stiff-necked people. God loves us. God's going to take care of us. God's going to banish the Canaanites. We're going to win an overwhelming victory, but let us not make that mistake. And to attribute that to our greatness, to our righteousness, God made a commitment to our forefathers. God loves us even if we are undeserving. They're corrupt. The Canaanites are corrupt. It's not necessarily because of us. And of course, the overarching takeaway from that is, is that just as we got it so easily because of God, we are liable to lose it if we misbehave, also as a result of God. And then Moshe reminds the nation of the terrible sin of the golden calf and everything that resulted as a consequence from that. Of course, that episode is found in the end of the book of Exodus. The Jewish people, they're at Sinai, and they have the Ten Commandments, and the following day Moses ascends the mountain, and he's going to be back in 40 days, He comes back with the first set of tablets and the nation is doing the sin of the golden calf. And Moses, of course, shatters those two tablets and begins the process of trying to rectify what happened, eventually going up a second time and eventually going up a third time and bringing back the second set of tablets on Yom Kippur. And the following day is when they began building or assembling the materials to build the tabernacle. So Moshe is going to go through these events now in the ensuing verses and also going to talk about some of the other sins that the Jewish nation has done over the course of the previous 40 years, again, to keep them in check, to remind them about the mistakes and to urge them to not follow their ways. So Moshe tells them, ascend to the mountain to get to the tablets of stone, I was there for 40 days and 40 nights without eating and drinking, which is a theme that repeats itself. Moshe is in heaven. He's like an angel. He doesn't need food and drink. God gave him these two stone tablets inscribed by the finger of Hashem. These are the product of God. Even the stone themselves, is. these are not the product of, of, of humans. Whereas the second set of tablets, Moshe prepares the stone and God writes upon the stone. The first set of tablets were all delivered to us by God. After 40 days and 40 nights, God gives me the two stone tablets, Moshe continues, and he tells him, go descend quickly. The people became corrupt. They strayed quickly from the way that I commanded them. They made themselves a molten image. And God wanted to destroy them, and Moshe intervened, and he breaks the tablets. He goes up a second time. He goes back to the fact that he took the calf, the golden calf, and ground it up and threw it into the water. It doesn't mention the fact that he made them drink it. And like we saw in Exodus, 
whoever participated in the golden calf, when they drank the water that was infused with the dust of the golden calf, they died. But it's not mentioned over here. The Rabban says it's to preserve the dignity of the people. He talks about the sin of the spies and various other sins. And he also talks about the fact that he prayed to save them. God wanted to destroy them. And ultimately, God relented and completely forgave the nation. And chapter 10 begins to talk about the second set of tablets. At that time, Hashem said to me, carve for yourself two stone tablets at the first ones and ascend to me to the mountain and make a wooden ark for yourself. So it's important for us to remember the timeline on the day that is celebrated as Shavuos, the sixth day of Sivan. We have the Ten Commandments. The following day, Moses drives up to heaven. Forty days later, comes back on the 17th day of Tammuz, the Jewish people are doing the golden calf. The following day he goes up again for 40 days and 40 nights. And then the following day he goes up for a third time. And that's what's mentioned over here. The third time he's going to go up for 40 days and 40 nights. This time he's going to bring with him two stone tablets. And he's also told earlier to uh, to make a wooden ark for it. And I shall inscribe on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets that you smashed, that you shattered, and you shall place them in the ark. So now we know that in the tabernacle, there was the other ark, the ark that was built by Bezalel, the ark of the of the tabernacle. Here, Rashi tells us that this is a second ark. This is a wooden ark that was not part of the tabernacle, at least ostensibly. It's a big discussion here, as we'll, as we'll see. But this is before the building of the tabernacle. Because the building of the tabernacle only happened after Yom Kippur, and this is 40 days prior when Moses is ascending to heaven to get the second set of tablets. And Rashi, in fact, tells us that this ark is not the same ark that Petzalel made. And after this was used to store the tablets, and then eventually Petzalel makes the second ark to store the tablets— it's transferred from the first ark, the ark of Moses, the, the wooden ark, into the golden ark of Betsalo. And later on, subsequently, it's used to lead the nation into wartime. When the Jewish people would go into war, says Rashi, they would use not the golden ark that was inside the tabernacle, but the wooden ark that's described over here in chapter 10, verse 1, the one that Moses built. That's what Rashi says. Now, the Ramban, he disagrees with that. He says... Uh, two questions. Number one, he says, after the tablets were transitioned from the Ark of Moses to the Ark of Betzalel, so the Ark of Moses was empty. So it doesn't make sense that they would keep an empty Ark. What would they put inside of it? It was just an empty Ark. It was, it was an empty box, in effect. In addition, where did they store it? We know that in the Holy of Holies, there was the golden ark, the one built by, Bet- by Betzalel, the one built and described in, in, in the end of Exodus. This wooden ark, they didn't have two arks inside the Holy of Holies. Where did they keep it? So the Ramban says, no, after they transferred the tablets from the ark of Moses, from the wooden ark to the ark of Betzalel, the golden ark, then they buried this first ark it did its time, and they put it away. Now, there's another interesting question here that the Ramban and others ask. We know that Moses went up the first time to get the first tablets. And at the first time, he's not told by God to make an ark to put it in. But only now, when he's going up a third time to get the second set of tablets, only then does God tell him to make an ark to store it in? So why did God not tell Moses to make an ark for the first set of tablets that uh, he was given the first time that Moses went up to the mountain, up to heaven? So the Ramban says that God knew that ultimately the first set of tablets would be shattered, and therefore he knew he wouldn't need an ark. Interesting idea the Ramban says. The Arachayim, he says something fascinating. He says that the first set of tablets were made by God. It's the, entirely the hand work of God. Of course, the second set of tablets, the stones were made by Moses and the inscription was made by God. So it was partially the hand work of God, partially the hand work of Moses. But the first set of tablets were entirely by God and therefore it did not need an ark. It would be, it seems like from his wording, they would stand on their own. The plan was to have it 
in front of everyone, it would not be placed in an ark. Whereas the second set of tablets are on a spiritually lower level and therefore needed to be placed in an ark. Now, ultimately, both the first set of tablets that were shattered and the second set of tablets that were not were placed inside the ark, the golden ark that was in the tabernacle. Okay, so then Moshe continues to go through the history of the people and he talks about the fact that he descended from the mountain. He actually brought the second set of tablets and placed them in the ark that I had made and they remained there as the Almighty had commanded. And then it talks about the various journeys that the nation had taken. It talks about the passing of Aaron and the succession of his son Elazar. And the Rashi here tells us that it's judged opposed to the shattering of the tablets because the death of the righteous is as injurious to the world as the destruction of the tablets. It talks about the designation of the Levites as clergymen. Of course, you have the Kohanim, that part of the Levite tribe that they're actually doing the work and the service in the tabernacle and subsequently the temple. And you have the rest of the Levites who are there to aid in uh, in oversight, in management of the tabernacle and the temple and other responsibilities and then we read a very fascinating verse in verse 12 of chapter 10. Now, O Israel, what does Hashem your God ask of you? This is an amazing introduction of a verse. What does God actually want from us? What does the Almighty really want? And then we find the answer only to fear Hashem your God, to go in his ways, to love him, and to serve Hashem your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to observe the commandments of Hashem and his decrees, which I commanded you today for your benefit. This is an amazing verse. It begins by telling us what does God really want? What's the easy thing? What's the bottom line that God really wants from us? Then it goes on to say fear of heaven, love of God, going in God's ways, emulating God, worshiping God with all our hearts with all our soul, and observing all the Torah. So it seems like the question doesn't really jive with the answer. So this is a big discussion, but the Talmud tells us uh, that from this we can deduce that all is in the hands of heaven aside from fear of heaven. What does God really want? What is the underlying essence of every mitzvah? Fear of heaven. The only decisions that we could do in the world that's not predetermined by God is Fear of heaven, and that really is an easy thing, at least from Moshe's perspective. For us, maybe it's very difficult, but for Moshe, he's like, what does God really want? It's it's so easy, all he wants is fear of heaven. The Talmud also tells us that this verse is a hint to the fact that we're supposed to do 100 blessings every day. Now, the Ramban, he adds that we have to read verse 12 and verse 13 together, because verse 12 talks about all the things that God wants. And then verse 13 ends, for your benefit. Don't think that God making all these requests, all these mitzvahs from us, it's for his benefit. Rather, it really is all ultimately for our benefit. And it continues that, Behold, to Hashem your God are the heavens, the highest heavens, the earth, Hashem loved our forefathers and therefore he chose us as a result. Again, the idea of chosen people. You should cut away the barrier of your heart and no longer stiffen your neck. Now in Hebrew, this actually reads as you should circumcise your heart and you should try to move away the uh, or remove the stiff neck. Interestingly, it compares the idea, the, the 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 transformation of someone who coming close to God as circumcision of the heart. What that implies is that our relationship to God is extant. It's just concealed underneath layers of separation. And we have to remove the proverbial foreskin of our heart to restore the relationship that is really there. It's just hidden. It is dormant. In fact, the Talmud tells us that this is a reference to the Yetzirah, the Talmud tells us, the book of Sukkot, page 52a, that Yetzirah has seven different names, and Moses, he called it a foreskin. And therefore, we're told here to remove the foreskin of our heart. It's a way of being told that we should remove the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. The Ramban, he explains that this verse highlights the two impediments to change. First, it talks about circumcision of the foreskin of the heart. What that means is that our heart, our capacity to be impacted, is covered, is sealed. We're not impressionable. The message doesn't get home because it is covered by the Yetzirah. That's problem number one. 
Problem number two is that we're stiff-necked, we're stubborn, we're set in our ways, and that makes change very difficult. These are the two problems. The problem number one is that we're not impressionable. The message is not absorbed. Problem two, even if the message is absorbed, we have to also not be too stubborn, not to be too set in our ways to be able to take the message home and to utilize it to change. And then it talks about the various characteristics of God. Hashem, your God, he has all the power. He is a great, mighty, and awesome God. He doesn't show favor or accept bribes. We cannot cajole God. We cannot corrupt him with our bribes. He carries out the judgment of orphans and widows. He loves the proselyte. He loves the convert. And therefore, we too should emulate him. We should also love the proselyte. We should also love the convert, for we were strangers in the land of Egypt. In Hebrew, this flows very nicely because the word for a convert and the word for a stranger are the same, the word ger. So we have to love the ger. We have to love the convert because we were gerim. We were converts. We were strangers in the land of Egypt. And this is an idea that we're told that we have to empathize with someone. We have to think about what they're going through and remember the time that we were going through something similar. We all know the feeling of being out of place. And just like we were like that in Egypt, we were the foreigners. We were the outsiders. We maybe felt a little bit not so comfortable, not so at home. That's what the convert is going through. And therefore, we have to empathize with that and we have to love him extra even though they're included in the midst of loving your fellow, we're told in addition to love especially the convert. Then we read another uh, fascinating verse. Hashem your God shall you fear, he you shall serve, to him you shall cleave, in his name you shall swear. The Talmud in the book of Psachim tells us that from this we derive the idea of reverence for the Torah scholar. The Talmud tells us that the word et, which is a word that doesn't have an English parallel, but it's it's a word that describes in addition. And when it says over here, et Hashem you should, you should you should fear Hashem your God, but it's something in addition to God. And the problem that the Talmud says, wait a minute, how could there be anything in addition to God? That sounds a little bit theologically problematic. And then Rabbi Hiva shows up and he says, no, what this is hinting at is that not only should you fear Hashem your God, but you should also fear, you should also have reverence for the Torah sages. And finally, chapter 10 concludes, he is your praise, he is your God, he did all these wonderful things for you, with 70 souls your ancestors descended to Egypt, and now look at you, you are like the stars of heaven for abundance. God deserves our allegiance. Look what he did for us. Chapter 11 begins with the mitzvah to love Hashem your God, to safeguard his charge, his decrees, his ordinances, and his commandments all the days. This is, of course, a theme that is going to be repeated again and again and again throughout the book of Deuteronomy. And then repeats the principle that we ourselves saw the miracles, we saw the vanquishing of Egypt and her chariots, we saw what happened to the conspirators of Korah when the land swallowed them up. The Rabban asks why there's no mention of Korah himself. After all, he was the ringleader. leader, he was the one who began the insurrection against Moses. And why does it not mention that he was consumed by the fire, or his people were consumed by the fire? Why does it only mention the fact that they were swallowed up by the magical miraculous sinkhole that swallowed up Korah's co-conspirators. And the Rabban says a very powerful idea. He says the fact that Korah and his people were punished because they tried to encroach upon the worship, the, the, the service of Aaron and his children, that's not a wilderness-specific miraculous punishment. He talks about King Uziyahu, we read about in, in the book of Chronicles, he offered incense even though he wasn't a Kohen and he became a leper for the rest of his life. The idea of someone encroaching upon the role of the Kohen and being punished in a miraculous way is not something which is specific to the wilderness and therefore Korach and what happened to Korach and his people or part of his people, that's not mentioned over here. Obey the commandments that I command you today. Be strong, and as a result, you will come to inherit the land. The land is wonderful. It's way better than Egypt. Even the city of Hebron, Rashi tells us, which is the worst part of the land of Israel, and therefore it's designated as a burial place, it's still better than the best part of the land of Egypt. 
But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of mountains and valleys. From the rain of heaven, it will drink water. A land that Hashem your God seeks out. The eyes of Hashem your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year to years. And Rashi tells us that this is a reference to the judgment that happens every year on Rosh Hashanah. In addition, Rashi tells us that this is the land through which the spiritual oversight and care for the whole world comes forth through. Of course, the Almighty takes care of the world, but the reason why he takes care of the whole world is because first he takes care of the land of Israel, and once he is dealing with terra firma, once he's dealing with the world, he already says, okay, I'm dealing with the land of Israel, and therefore, as a result, I'll deal with the rest of the world. Verse 13 of chapter 11 is the beginning of the second paragraph of the Shema. We already had the third paragraph of the Shema, chapter 15 of the Book of Numbers. Previously in Deuteronomy, we had the first paragraph of the Shema, and now we're going to go to the middle paragraph of the Shema, the second paragraph of the Shema. It will be that if you hearken to my commandments that I command me today to love Hashem your God, to serve Him with all your heart, with all your soul, then I'll provide rain for your land at a proper, in its proper time, the early and the late rain, so you may gather in your grain, your wine, and your oil. Again, this is an amazing land, but of course, it's a land that needs water. And will you have water? It depends. If you listen to God, you listen to the commandments, you love him, you worship him, you serve him, then you can have the land in its proper time. And it's going to be convenient. Rashi tells us that it's going to rain in a time where it's not inconvenient. It'll be at nights. It'll rain on Friday nights where everyone's home. You're going to gather in your grain. Things will be fantastic. Be grass in your field for your cattle. You'll eat, you'll become satisfied. However, beware for yourself, lest your heart be seduced, and you turn astray and serve the gods of others. You prostrate yourselves to them. Then the wrath of Hashem will blaze against you. He will restrain the heaven. There won't be any rain. The ground won't produce its produce. You'll be swiftly banished from the goodly land that Hashem gives to you. So this is another amazing prediction here and promise. If we obey the Torah, we'll have prosperity and goodness. Otherwise, we will be banished from the land and we will not have the prosperity, we won't have the rain, things will be terrible. Again, we see the idea that satiation will lead to rebellion. If we eat and we were prosperous and we're satisfied, maybe we'll be seduced and we'll turn astray and we'll serve the gods of others. The land won't produce, will be swiftly perished from the land. Rashi asked an interesting question. Why is this different than the generation of the flood? The generation of the flood, they too descended into the depths of idolatry, but they were given a reprieve of 120 years before the punishment happened. Here we're told that the land won't produce and will be swiftly perished from the land. Why is it swiftly? Why are we given the same 120-year reprieve? And the answer is because the nation of the flood, they did not have Torah to guide them. And therefore, the Almighty was more merciful with them, was more, so to speak, understanding with them. They maybe didn't know any better. And therefore, they had 120 years to rectify their ways. Whereas the Jewish people, we have Torah, we have all this guidance to make sure that we don't go astray. And consequently, we have a much shorter leash. If we descend to idolatry, we will be swiftly banished from the land. And these messages are so important that we should place them upon our hearts and upon our soul, bind them as a sign upon our arms, let them be an ornament between our eyes. Again, this is the idea of to fill in, teach them to our children to discuss them when we sit in our home, when we walk on the way, when we retire, when we arise, inscribe them upon our doorposts. That, of course, is the mezuzah, the doorposts of our home and upon our gates. In order to prolong your days and the days of your children upon the land, that Hashem has sworn to your forefathers to give them like the days of the heaven over the earth. There's a very interesting Ramban here in Rashi to talk about an idea that if you read this paragraph, it talks about us being banished from the land. And then it talks about studying Torah, place the words of mine upon your heart. And then it talks about the tefillin, which is a mitzvah that we do with our body. We put the tefillin upon our heads and upon our arms next to our heart. And it talks about the mezuzah, another mitzvah that we do. So Rashi and the Ramban both talk about the idea that we have to obey body-bound mitzvahs, i.e. mitzvahs that are not related to the temple, to the tabernacle, or to agriculture. We have to obey those mitzvahs even in the diaspora. 
it seems like there was a good reason to maybe suggest that only when we're in the land of Israel, only then must we obey the mitzvos. But once we leave, we don't need to obey the mitzvos. And therefore, we're told here, no, even though you've been banished from the land, you still have to obey those body-bound mitzvos in the diaspora. But Rashi and the Ramban add a very powerful idea. Why must we obey the Torah? Why must we obey the mitzvos outside of the land of Israel? So you would think because, well, we should obey the Torah wherever we are. Rashi says, no, it's more than that. So that way, when we come back to Israel, the mitzvot shouldn't be foreign to us. We shouldn't need a refresher course once we return to the land of Israel. This is a very powerful idea that really the Torah is supposed to be for us as guidance when we're in the land of Israel. That's the normal, natural setting of the Jewish people. And yes, we obey the Torah outside of Israel. And yes, that's obligatory, but that's not an ideal situation. We should try to hustle and get back to the land of Israel if it is possible. And we may argue, and of course I'm speaking to myself here, that it's going to be an indictment on our nation, the fact that we had the opportunity to go back to the land of Israel and maybe we delayed. In in modern times, it's actually quite easy for us to be there and yet we're quite comfortable in the diaspora. There's another interesting Ramban over here where he compares the first paragraph of the Shema with the second paragraph of the Shema that we read over here in the Suits Parsha. Both of them talk about studying Torah and teaching Torah to our children, but in the first paragraph it says you should teach them to your children and speak in words of Torah. And in the second paragraph of the Shema it says you should teach them to your children so that they should speak in the words of Torah. And what it tells us is that the beginning of parenting is for us to teach our children. But ultimately, the goal is not that the children should always be reliant upon us for their religious and spiritual life, but that they themselves, even after the parent is gone, they themselves will still speak words of Torah. They themselves will still do the mitzvot even after we are not there with them. My grandfather used to say that parenting is like taking a lit candle and lighting an unlit candle. Even after you withdraw the first candle, the second candle is still lit on its own merit. The goal of parenting, the goal of guidance is not just that the children should learn, should grow, should understand, should obey, should observe, should adhere. It's that they should develop their own connection with God so that way their connection with God will continue even after the parenting, the pedagogy is withdrawn. It's another interesting idea that Rashi here tells us in verse 21, where it talks about the fact that if we do the Torah, God will prolong our days in the land, i.e. back in the land of Israel that Hashem has sworn to your forefathers to give them. God promised to give the land of Israel to our forefathers. And Rashi tells us here, according from the Talmud in the book of Sanhedrin, that this is another hint in the written Torah to the idea of resurrection, that even Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they're still going to come back and they're still going to flourish in the land of Israel. The Parsha concludes, for if you will observe the entire commandment that I command you, perform them, love Hashem your God, walk in his ways. I, this is the third time that we're told to walk in God's ways. It's going to be fantastic. Hashem will drive out all these nations from before you. You'll drive out greater and mightier nations than yourself. You're great, they're even greater. You're mighty, they are even mightier. Every place where the sole of your foot shall tread shall be yours. This gives us the right to annex the neighboring lands. And those lands would assume the status of the land of Israel. So if you conquer parts of, let's say, what's today, Syria or Lebanon, uh, maybe even Egypt, they could be annexed to the greater land of Israel. And they will assume the status of the land of Israel and all its associated laws. No man will stop up against you. Hashem, your God, will set your terror and your fear on the face of the entire earth where you will tread as he spoke to you. Thus concludes Parshas Akev. Thank you all for listening. The website is torchweb.org. The email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I look forward to speaking to you again next week.